NASA's James Webb Space Telescope released stunning images of outer space this week. Webb is said to be the successor to the Hubble Telescope and is supposed to give a deeper glimpse into our universe. Here to talk about this groundbreaking technology is Dr. Avi Loeb, professor of science at Harvard and the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation. Dr. Loeb, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, I think we were all in awe of the images uh, we were seeing uh, yesterday. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the technology that makes this possible. Um, well, the James Webb Space Telescope is unique. Uh, first, in terms of its size, it's six and a half meters in diameter, about uh, seven times uh, in area than the Hubble Space Telescope that gave us a previous glimpse at the universe. And uh, it, it's also sensitive in the infrared. Uh, and um, if you imagine stars in the very early universe uh, emitting light in the optical visible band or the ultraviolet, that light will be stretched by the cosmic expansion so that it will appear in the infrared for us now. And so uh, this telescope is giving us sensitivity that is unprecedented to look at the very first stars and galaxies in the universe, uh, sort of the scientific uh, genesis of the light, uh, let there be light. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, uh, moreover, it allows us to uh, look for signs of life on other planets, and we can talk about that. Yeah, in fact, uh, one Twitter user uh, said of the telescope, uh, the James Webb Telescope can scan for chemical composition and atmospheres of exoplanets. This is the first one ever done, and it shows atmospheric water vapor. Prepare uh, for alien life reveal on other worlds soon. Is that something we should be think thinking about, little green men or, or something perhaps less dramatic? Not really on this planet. This is uh, a, a, what is called the gas giants. It's, it's half the mass of Jupiter, so it's made mostly of gas, whereas life as we know it is possible on a planet that, is, that has a rocky surface like the Earth with a thin atmosphere on top of it. Definitely not this planet, but we can tell that this planet has water on it, which is remarkable. Uh, of course, water is a necessary ingredient for life as we know it, but we also need uh, a solid surface with uh, a thin uh, atmosphere. So there will be uh, other planets that uh, perhaps will have that. And uh, for example, there is the Trappist uh, system of planets that uh, the web will look at. And uh, we look forward to seeing the composition of the atmospheres of some of those rocky planets. Um, and beyond that, there is obviously interest in uh, searching for um, how planets form and uh, uh, searching for fragments uh, that arrive to the solar system from other planetary systems. And can you talk about how it is that because of the nature of what we're doing, you know, we're peering across such a, a vast distance, we're, we're actually sort of seeing a, a snapshot in, in time, right, in, in the past because of it being, the, you know, the, the time it would take that those that you know light to reach us I'm, I'm butchering the actual science of it but can you an expert speak to that right so um, we know that uh, the universe is expanding so if we go back in time there was a time when the density of the universe was infinite that's called the big bang and uh, we don't know what happened before the big bang how the Big Bang emerged. But we can look at the universe after the Big Bang. And if we look at great distances, it takes light a long time to reach us from those distances. And therefore, we see how the universe looked like at early times. It's sort of like a time machine. But in fact, we're just looking far away. And we see what happened early on far away, which is remarkable. So we can get an image of how the universe looked like. The first image we have is of the so-called cosmic radiation background, cosmic microwave background, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That's a very short time. Back then, there were no galaxies, no stars. And after that, there was a period of that we called the Dark Ages, the Cosmic Dark Ages, that were followed by a cosmic dawn when the first stars formed in the universe and um, sort of lit up uh, like lights on a Christmas tree. And uh, we can look at those. And the web allows us the first glimpse at those early times when the first stars and galaxies formed. Uh, I started working on this subject about three decades ago. Back then, there were only a handful of people interested 
in it. Uh, and um, I was on the first uh, advisory committee that designed the James Webb Space Telescope for that purpose. Uh, it was uh, designed to be a telescope sensitive in the infrared so we can see at light that is arriving to us from far away. The first galaxies were very small. They were uh, sort of like Lego pieces that came together to make a galaxy like our own Milky Way galaxy today. And so they are very challenging to detect because they were faint, intrinsically faint, but also when we look at them, we are looking far away. So we have this uh, telescope, the Webb telescope, made of um, uh, a lot of segments, 18 segments of beryllium cold, uh, coated with gold that uh, was placed uh, a million miles away from Earth. Uh, and it, it is being uh, shielded from sunlight so that it's very cold and can look deep into space without any background from the atmosphere of the Earth or the sun. And uh, um, it cost us $10 billion, this telescope, but nature is very kind to us. It provides us with natural lenses. Uh, we call them gravitational lenses. Uh, when you have a cluster of galaxies, a collection of a thousand galaxies like the Milky Way together, uh, they can uh, focus the light from behind. Mm. And uh, then the uh, exceptional sensitivity of the James Webb Space Telescope is aided by a natural telescope, and we can go even deeper. That's the image that was shown in the White House. So the, telescope, right. the telescope yeah. is, is, is uh, you said, how far away? How long did it take to, to get it into position? Right. So. Uh, we're looking at an image of the universe that, uh, from 13 uh, billion years ago. Uh, the age of the universe, the Big Bang, took place 13.8. So the universe was an infant back then, and mm. uh, just about uh, 800 uh, million years. Uh, we think that the first stars, the first galaxies, started forming around 100 million years, so we still have a way to go. It's like an archaeological dig. The deeper we go, the more ancient are the layers that we uncover. Hmm. And you said earlier that, you know, you're, the, the, that particular planet wasn't likely to yield any evidence of life because it didn't have a rocky surface. But there's also this fra phrasing of life as we know it, life as we know it. It always strikes me as curious, I got to say, as a Star Trek fan, to think that we, we, we do conceptualize of human life as this kind of uh, or life is, you know, in these very human Earth-centric terms, is there not the possibility, is there any interrogation into what it would look like for life to develop on a gas giant or to be kind of uh, very different in form, uh, non-corporeal life, uh, different kinds of expressions of life? Is there a way to even think about and identify and try to search for those kinds of things as we get greater and greater capacity to look deeper and deeper into the universe? That's an excellent uh, question. And uh, one thing I learned by being a scientist is that we should be modest. Uh, I call it cosmic modesty because nature is more imaginative than we are. And it's quite possible that there are forms of life very different than we find here on Earth. Uh, for example, uh, most of the objects uh, that are rocky are actually far away from a host star and they are f completely frozen. But underneath the layer of ice on their surface, there could be an ocean. And the question is, is there life in that ocean? Are there fish? And there are some satellites uh, uh, of or moons of uh, planets in the solar system, like uh, Enceladus or Europa, that uh, are thought to potentially have life under the icy surface. It will be difficult for us to drill that surface, but we can see plumes of gas coming out, the uh, geysers, and we can search whether there are any in indications for life underneath the ice. Mm. Uh, but also in the gas uh, giants, uh, it's possible that there are different forms of life than we are used to. And uh, there was discussions about phosphine on Venus, that perhaps in the clouds of Venus, uh, there are droplets of water that carry life in them. Very different from what we see on Earth, because the surface of Venus is uh, too hot to maintain liquid water. And, you know, the, the sky is the limit in that sense. There could be many other uh, routes towards life that we don't even imagine at the moment. I very much hope that, uh, you know, seeing what happens in world politics, that, that there is intelligence higher than ours. <laughs> <out there. laughs> so anyway, 
<laughs> frustrated by what happens in DC, uh, may uh, just just stay tuned because we might learn something from a smarter kid on our cosmic block. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for shedding some uh, light on these wondrous images and describing them in such literary quality. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate it. My pleasure. We'll have more rising right after this.